So uh, I made a little uh, biography of myself. Um, I got on six meters back in 1990. Uh, I had done a lot of hamming prior to that on HF. And uh, as I got on the band, I found it to be very, very interesting. Um, it's really um, defined a lot of my ham radio activities in the last 30 plus years. Uh, I've written two books related to ham radio. One, Six Meters, A Guide to the Magic Band, which went through four editions. The last one built in 2008, it was, uh, last one was published. And I wrote a book with Gordon West, WB6NOA, on uh, VHF propagation, which covers six meters and two meters and other things like that. Uh, I've been talking about six meters for a better part of 25 plus years. Uh, I usually do the HRU each year. So um, I've been pretty busy. Um, six meters is often called the magic band by a lot of its uh, regular users. And uh, it's very quiet most of the time, except certain times of the year. Um, and it's really a good band to observe certain propagation modes and see how they work. The most common is sporadic E, which is present in the summer month from May through early August and a little minor season from November to January. There's Aurora activity. I will have a demonstration of Aurora. Uh, I have a recording here. F2 activity during the sunspot peak is uh, very possible on six meters. Uh, there's another mode called TEP or transequatorial propagation um, where you can work down into Latin America, down into Argentina. And I'll show a graphical demonstration on that later. Um, T, some, some of these modes can combine with each other and you can extend great distances. And I'll show some of the graphs. Um, six meter DX in the future. Well, in the summertime, we had very good summer season. Uh, show that for sporadic E, multiple hop sporadic E, which um, sideband CW and also FTA. Um, F2 is a very good mode for uh, daily uh, DX, but it depends on good sunspot and solar flux count, typically over 200. And uh, there's a lot of uh, guesses about what this cycle 25 is going to be like. Um, initially, it was projected to be worse than the last cycle, but now there's a new optimism that it might even be better. So we just have to wait and see, uh, observe stuff on 10 meters and then see how it works to six. <clears throat> but in the meantime, you can do sporadic E activity during the summer months from May through early August. Um, so with F2 being unpredictable for the future, sporadic E is our bread and butter mode for six meters for working DX. Um, it's a skyway propagation mode. And uh, as I said, from May to August, uh, makes it very interesting. And so when it occurs, uh, it can really make the band very uh, crowded with signals. Um, believe it or not, sporadic E was first discovered by radio hams back in 1935 on the five meter band, which is around 56 megahertz. Um, they used to call it irregular E propagation. They didn't know what it was about. And over the years, more and more data, scientific studies has collected information. We know that occurs about 70 miles above Earth in the E region of the ionosphere. Uh, the thin layers of metallic ions, um, these layers are only about one uh, kilometer thick, but they could be many, many miles in diameter. And you can hear sporadic e activity uh, 10 meters during the summer as well. And as the particles in sporadic e clouds um, get thicker, they can reflect higher frequencies. Um, formations can last as little as five minutes to as many as several hours. Um, 
there may be a lot of fading because of the non-uniformity of the sporadic E. Um, I have here a sporadic E cloud, which I purchased tonight on my way here. Uh, looks like a sponge. And that's basically what a sporadic E cloud can look like. You can't see it there, it's, it's invisible. Um, the reason why I use a sponge, and this was made by my father for me many years ago for my talks, um, a sponge is not uniform. There's holes in it. And, um, you know, this is, say, reflective on six meters. But as the particles get thicker and the sponge becomes denser, it can reflect mm -hmm. radio waves as high as two meters. And I have worked sporadically on two meters into the Midwest and into Florida. Uh, happens about once a year. Uh, in the old days on TV, you could see uh, cross-channel interference going above channel seven when you get into two meter range. So um, I bring this around um, to give you a general idea. It's a non-uniform uh, formation. Um, signals can get very loud. You can run more power. Um, you don't necessarily need to kill watt. 100 watts would do well, but you can do well on 10 watts. So the major season is uh, really peak time is June and July. Um, and that's where you start to get multiple uh, formation. And there's a minor season from November to January, as I said before. Um, sporadic E formations consist of metallic ions, iron, magnesium, nickel, silicon, and other metals. And that has been determined by rocket studies that were conducted in the 60s and the 70s, last century, as there was a lot of interest in sporadic E because of the tremendous interference situation it would cause on TV broadcast band. And um, the summer season seems to be much more enhanced because you have oxygen ions in the E region as well that aid in the uh, formation of these metallic ions. And uh, during the summer season, you can have multiple formations. This allows you to work DX into Europe, and I'll cover that in a little bit. And as I stated before, as the formations get denser, the higher frequencies can be reflected. And uh, when that happens, you might hear short skip on say 10 meters and you know, it could go on six meters. If you hear short six, skip on six meters where stations are less than 500 miles away, it's a good idea to check out two meters. Um, one thing that's important to know, sporadic E is basically independent of the solar cycle. There's low variation year to year as far as the amount of currencies. There may be some better years, of course, but they're not really dependent on solar activity. So this is a graphical representation of single Hop sporadic E on six meters. Um, you can cover 700 to 1200 miles on a single hop skip. The sporadic E layer is up about 70 kilometers, I'm sorry, 100 kilometers, 70 miles up. And that's a very straightforward uh, representation. Um, it's important to know that polarization doesn't matter whether it's horizontal or vertical because the signals are rotating as they approach the formation and come off of it. However, uh, most people use horizontal beams to give them focused direction wherever they point. Uh, from our location in Long Island, that's basically what a single hop range would look like for a sporadic E. As I said, 500, 700 miles to 1,000 miles per single hop. Um, so very easy to work into the South Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, and to the Midwest, if there's a formation in that direction to Minnesota, Wisconsin. So that's why general range of coverage for a single hop. Um, there's a VUCC award, which uh, is based on working 100 grid squares. We are in grid square FN30, and a grid square is basically two degrees wide by one degree high uh, by 
let me get right, geographic uh, coordinates, not geographic, geographic coordinates. And as I said, we're in FM 30, which covers pretty much most of Long Island, except the very east. And uh, very easy to work into the EM grid field, which is south, which covers Georgia, Florida. Uh, these maps are easily available on the internet. Would normally reproduce it here. Um, the real fun when you approach June and July, you have a lot of sporadic E formations around. And uh, there are days where I've been able to count five or six sporadic E formations just through mathematical plotting where the stations are and using the halfway point. And uh, it's through double hop, we can work long range. And uh, it is not unreasonable to work Europe a few times a month. That's about three to four hops. Three hops, which take you to the Azores, which is um, just uh, west of Portugal. And four, that would be about two hops. And three hops would take you into the UK and uh, the uh, western part of Spain and Portugal. And that's a graphical representation, a very crude one, actually. And here's that map again. And you can work into the West, New Mexico, California, Nevada. That's a general range of double hop uh, coverage. Um, yeah. Now, things six meters was... Um, Primarily a sideband and CW band up to about 2015. And then you had FT8 come along and a lot of hams jumped on that because with FT8, you can work signals below human hearing range. I think human hearing is what, um, nine uh, dB roughly. So you can work really low dB range that you can't hear but your computer can hear. So um, there was a decline in sideband CW activity on six meters in the last four to five years, except during contest. Um, while FT8 makes it easier to work uh, stations, um, it's still not at the speed of say a sideband station can do when they're running stations. So it does take a little longer to make a digital contact. Uh, but improvements continue to be made, so it may be quicker. Right now, I think it takes about a minute to do an FT8 contact, where a sideband in a contest, you can do two to three a minute. So um, there's been some uh, paradigm shifts with six meters. Um, get back to uh, multiple hop, sporadic E. Um, as I mentioned, um, you could see five to six transatlantic uh, openings between the east coast of the U.S. and to Europe. And as I said, June and July is the peak time for a lot of these formations. And as we said, it's not affected by a solar cycle, and you can probably do well with 100 watts. Um, this, in this presentation, I have an older um, opening that I covered, uh, probably one of the best openings I've had in uh, my ham radio career on six meters it was back in 2009, which is 12 years ago. Uh, this was one of these openings where the band was open uh, five plus hours. And these are stations I worked in the two hop range was Portugal, three hop I'd work in most of Western Europe into um, Northern Ireland, uh, UK, uh, Belgium, and the four hop range a little bit into Eastern Europe where Croatia and Slovenia. Uh, this is one of my favorite openings. Uh, literally filled about two pages of log. I couldn't believe it. Um, again, the funny thing about that opening, after the Europeans came in, it started opening towards the West and it's working a lot of stuff into uh, New Mexico and California in the evening. So it was very, very unusual conditions. Everything seemed to line up right. Now, that was 2009. However, this year was a pretty good year. Um, FT8 was pretty much a daily occurrence for people to work in Europe. 
what you see here are um, 11 openings I had transatlantic where I worked uh, primarily CW and a few sideband stations. Uh, worked some of these openings, um, they typically lasted about an hour. They opened maybe 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon mm -hmm. Eastern time. And uh, it was actually a pretty good summer, I thought. Um, and of course, you can imagine what the FT8 activity must have been like. Uh, it was a little bit better than this because CW is basically a little higher range, a higher decibel range in which signals can be heard. Um, from the scientific literature, they've been able to plot sporadic E uh, physically. And you can see here over time, you have a very thin layer uh, and it's slightly uh, descending towards Earth uh, until it basically breaks up. Um, this is this plot was through ISCAT radar that's situated in Europe. So it's nice to have some of the scientific stuff with it. Uh, a lot of people ask what causes sporadic E. Uh, some people have a belief that thunderstorm activity causes it, um, but thunderstorms don't typically go very much higher than 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers where sporadic E is typically at 100. Um, general theory believes that oxygen ions in the summertime recombine with the neutral metal particles that come in. The Earth is bombarded every day with metallic uh, particles from meteor ablation. But when they combine with oxygen ion, they become ion ionized themselves and they have the ability to reflect radio waves when a lot of them are combined. And uh, it's quite an interesting process, uh, not fully defined, but this is what the general belief is. There's also uh, another component to it where you have wind shear and the wind shear of the different winds in the ionosphere that causes the compression of these particles into like a thin layer, just like this uh, sponge here and it allows it to become like an invisible mirror at 100 kilometers up. And eventually it breaks up over time because you have gravity uh, and tidal waves pushing down on it. So they eventually break up and you know just drop to earth. Um, this, I wouldn't ask you to memorize, it's just a, a general idea of how sporadic E works and how some of the particles actually go back up, some go back down to earth. Um, it's a general theory, it hasn't been fully proven, but um, it's workable in the meantime. Um, now, the prominence of FT8 in the last five years pretty much shows that sporadic E can almost be a daily occurrence during the summer months. And uh, weak sporadic E uh, openings can be picked up by this mode where we can't hear it under normal things or hear the beacons. So um, it is a very good scientific piece of information. And uh, the one thing that seems, FT8 seems to show that there still is a void of sporadic E activity in equinox period, which is September to October and March to April. Uh, but it does show there's a lot of activity on the six meter band when you can't hear it, you know, with normal human hearing. And uh, there are some limitations of it uh, with regards to speed and amount of activity. There's two FT8 frequencies at six. 50.313 and 50.323. And uh, even though the digital signals only takes up a sliver, it can get quite uh, busy with those signals. Um, another thing, uh, because of wind shear, these sporadic E particles tend to uh, collect over time. And uh, they, uh, you know, they hit uh, dead spots in the ionosphere and they tend to become like uh, collected and they create like a, a swimming pool effect 
we have all these particles joining together uh, that where they can uh, actually reflect radio waves. Okay. Uh, here's an interesting mode. We have not heard it in a while because geomagnetic activity has been low. And, uh, but it's a very fascinating mode. <laughs> okay, that's a little better. Um, there weren't too many in cycle 24, which is the previous cycle. And uh, it's a very interesting mode here. Um, I'm gonna show a graphical representation here. Aurora is a very interesting mode in, in that it's a backscatter mode. So the Aurora, which you can see visually with the Northern Lights, is also uh, a radio mode, um, a uh, audio mode as well. And uh, typically when you work stations by Aurora, say in this location, you point your antenna to North toward Canada. And uh, you reflect off the edge of the aurora back to stations that will be in this path. Um, the interesting thing is aurora signals are terribly distorted. So I'm going to put a demonstration here. Okay. That's my signal. I'm calling a Canadian station in Ontario, BE3 uh, KZ. So that, that was a Canadian station. At that time, I was running just 10 watts uh, to a dipole. I was really a very simple station. I have a dream now. But um, you notice they put an A in the signal report because it makes no sense to give you a tone because it's terribly distorted. So Aurora contacts, um, you can do on sideband, but it's really difficult. It's like listening to someone drinking water, uh, it's so distorted. So CW is a very viable mode. I don't think FTA is gonna be an easy mode to use Aurora. Um, so with Aurora, I've worked into Canada, into um, you know parts of uh, the Northeast, uh, uh, New England. But one of my most favorite contacts was I was so uh, portable and hot pot. I worked the station 20, uh, less than 20 miles away, but not by pointing directly at him, but pointing north. So we had the aurora distortion. So, um, so that was really funny and we were laughing about it. Uh, imagine pointing north, you know, like a couple hundred miles each way to work somebody that's only tw uh, 12 miles away. So it was kind of fun. So uh, we should probably see more of these effects uh, probably in about two years time as we get geomagnetic uh, storms and uh, hits from the sun. Another mode uh, on six meters also go increases during sunspot activity is transequatorial. 
the area around the magnetic equator is highly charged in the upper as solar activity increases and it allows for um, trans equatorial propagation. It's like a ducting over the equator. And uh, typically a path would be from Argentina to Florida. So we would not necessarily be able to work it. However, through, um, first I'll show a uh, representation here with a uh, ducting effect. It enters like a little uh, area above the F layer and then it just ducks through over the equator and then it comes out. But we can actually work uh, into Argentina this way through combination of sporadic E and TEP. Uh, I've done it in May and I've done it in October. And you can see here uh, a contact that I made with LW4EX back in uh, 2002. Ken, uh, I don't so know. You can see how that works. I don't know if there's a problem with the display, but we're still seeing the Aurora activity on six meter slide. Uh, here's a more recent one that I worked in 2014 in May. Uh, this is a combination sporadic E plus TEP. The sporadic E path is probably on my side. Uh, these would be typically uh, Latin American stations you work on the TEP side. And what was nice about this, I worked three different countries, three different stations. And uh, I worked this in May of 2014. Uh, a month and a half later, I gave a talk on six meters at the Aero Convention in Hartford. And that station CE3CSX in Chile, which you see on this plot, he was at my talk and I couldn't believe it, you know. So he didn't have his QSL card with him, but whatever. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. And this was with moderate solar activity. So even though we didn't get the conventional F2 stuff, we did get the TEP. Oh, okay. As I said, these are the primary modes used on six meters, sideband CW, and lately it's been about 75, 80% digital. Uh, but VHF contest, it kind of evens out a bit. Um, as I said, this was a good summer for all the modes. Um, it was designed by Joe Taylor and Steve Frankie, and basically was used for sporadic E, um, you know, because sometimes there would be propagation, you can't hear it with human hearing. And there it is, 12 hertz. So uh, signals below that range, you know, would be FT8 uh, territory. So simple exchange would be signal report, your grid square and a 73 to acknowledge the completion of the contact. At minus three dB or so, uh, some audio, audible tones can be heard. Uh, but at some point when it gets really strong, then it makes uh, sense to go to the other modes. Um, and I said this limitations on that. Uh, six meters is a great portable band. You only need 112 inches for a dipole. So a three element beam is very easy to set up. Uh, the setup on the left is um, a three element beam. Uh, that set up for uh, W2AMC in South Hole during field day about six or seven years ago. <laughs> Jimmy Hendrix has arrived. The setup on the right is a portable beam that I used for Bolt Hill during uh, the January VHF contest. You can see all the snow there. Um, so it's a very easy band to set up for portable operation. Doesn't take much at home either. Um, the three VHF contests um, that are held on, by the ARLs, January, June, and September, uh, 
typically starts at two o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday and it goes till 11 o'clock Sunday night. But most times you only operate maybe uh, a quarter of that time period, depending on stations there around. And there's a CQ worldwide in the second week in July. Um, this changes a little bit, but uh, 50.125 is still the domestic call frequency. 50.110 is the X call frequency. These are for CW and sideband. The digital modes, as I mentioned, 50.313 and 50.323 or where uh, the digital activity is for FT8 and also FT4. Uh, Europeans like to be between 50.080 and 105, as I found out this summer. Uh, here's a typical internet site uh, for spawning ON4 KST, Kilo Sierra Tangle. Very helpful, they have an interactive map and there are people chatting. And uh, as I said, it was a good summer. Uh, I've gotten a few cards already since for uh, contacts. Um, I've gotten like four cards from the Netherlands here, um, different cards here. And I got a station from Sweden. Uh, this guy only operates CW. So he was very patient this whole summer to work. Uh, into the US and he finally did, we made contact in uh, late July. So we were very happy about that. So, okay, um, if anybody's interested, I have the last remaining copies of the six meter book, the fourth edition. Um, those of you who are not here, you can go to my email address, wb2amu at qrz.com and just drop me a note. I, I pr pretty much have the last two boxes of this book, which went out of print in 2008. So that makes it what, 13 years? So uh, I have some available. I sell them for $10 a piece plus $5 shipping. So uh, I will sign and personalize anybody who's interested in this. And I think that's it. So I'll take any questions. There is a question from Andy, 82 ESY. Is there any data regarding propagation in the diffusion of chemtrails, which include many elemental particles? I'm sorry. I can't really hear that. Okay. Is there any data regarding propagation from the diffusion of chemtrails? which include many elemental particles. Um, I have not seen too many articles on that. There are a lot of articles in the 60s and 70s where they look at things like that, meteor trails. Uh, when you say chem trails, what are you specifically? I guess he's referring to, I guess he's talking about planes. Uh, yeah, that you wouldn't see on six, but you might see on some of the really high VHF bands where they reflect in the microwave region. So um, that I'm not personally familiar with. I just heard some studies on very, very high frequencies. This is uh, Lou NY2H. I have a question. Hi. So in the Southern Hemisphere, I guess because summer is there when winter is here, that all the things that apply here in June and July, apply there in uh, their, I guess, December period. Is that true? Correct. November through January would be their peak sporadic E season. So it would be the reverse. Oh, I'm sorry. I never know where to draw. <laughs> it would be, uh, that's correct. November through January would be their peak sporadic E season. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if you go on the ON4 KST site beginning in November, you might see some of the Argentinians and Chile stations um, listing contacts that they're making by single hop sporadic E. So, oh. Hey, again. <clears throat> 
a couple of weeks back <clears throat> on our Monday Night Net, we had a station log in over the radio, not via Echolink or anything, from North Carolina. Would that, uh, uh, this was on two meters, would that likely have been an e-skip one hop or an e-skip two hop on two meters? Uh, that's most likely tropo. Oh, okay. This was at like eight o'clock at night. Yes. <clears throat> yes, uh, tropo, believe it or not, uh, there is a relatively common path from Long Island to um, the Outer Banks of North Carolina. And uh, how we know that, there's a Coast Guard station uh, around 150 megahertz, can be heard almost daily during the summer uh, into September and October. But that is most likely a tropical opening through ducting. There may have been some weather patterns uh, between well, hot and cold fronts. Yeah, it was, it was a couple of weeks back when we were in that really, really, really hot week or two that we yeah. had. Exactly. Yeah, I, I find tropo is interesting sporadically, um, but typically it's almost the same path from Long Island that hits North Carolina and occasionally maybe into New England. Um, there are some tropo paths in the interior of the country, not far from, say, uh, rivers and some lakes, but they have these, it's basically uh, front oriented. Sometimes you get a hurricane coming up the coast can create a lot of interesting paths. There's a website you can go to that kind of predicts it called Hepburn, Hotel Echo Popper, Bravo Uniform Radio November, uh, Tropo Maps. You put that in your uh, Google browser and you can see his predictions and also what occurred. And it's generally, generally uh, accurate but if you look at a weather map, say, uh, during your regular news forecast, um, you can see where a potential path can happen when you talk about warm front and cold front, you know, going to collide. And uh, Tropo is very pronounced on uh, two meters, sometimes on six. And I have worked into North Carolina on 432. It was the strangest thing. I was just had it on, you know, just sitting there in a quiet moment during a contest, and I heard this guy booming in from the outer banks. So it can happen. Uh-oh. Uh Someone didn't pay up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any other questions? When we talk about digital, we mainly talk about FD. Yes. Is there much FD for us? Um, yeah, on six, I don't think Packet ever took hold of like years ago. FT4, but FT8, uh, I think the first one was JT65. Then it went to FT8, and I think FT4, maybe newer, I'm not sure. Yeah. There's some speed issues between the two. And uh, I am not an expert, I, I just, this is what I'm just hearing. There are differences in speed. Um, I do see him chatting about it in uh, the only 4 KST site. And some people will say, you know, I can make a contact using this one, but not with this one. So I think the jury is still out as far as which is better for certain uh, type of activity. But um, we'll find out, yes. Hey, listen, on FD8 and 6, my SP does not move. I got a five element beam about uh, 60 feet up. Is that, that what it is nowadays? Um, well, I had some QRP stations say they worked on, but it also depends how many stations on the river. That means the estimate doesn't even move. Yeah, that would be true, because let's think of the S meters like the meters and such, right? So um, it's, it's so low, uh, it's at a negative range, uh, but that would make sense, yes. I'm trying to go into CQ and see what happens. Yeah, I've been trying to get those things. You'll just do that at FT8 and see who comes back. I'm not even seeing anything in the, you know, coming down yeah. on the side. She's not receiving anything. Yeah. Usually with FT4 and FT8, they recommend to turn off for HVC, which is the SMU. Yeah. 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 
I know when they have HIV, they should be someone who talks about it to me, but they're not necessarily the six meter homes. I think there's some shades of differences on six meters compared to the HF. Uh, Jill Taylor and Frankie uh, wrote, wrote the code and developed this. They really had six meters in mind, but as you know, it's spread into a HF pretty rapidly. So um, that was the way it worked. Any other questions? Yeah, Ken, we've got a question from Barry on online. Barry, W-A-2-V-I-U. Barry, why don't you go ahead? Hi. Um, so when you mentioned these calling frequencies, uh, I'm not sure how that works. Normally on the HF bands, you just uh, call CQ wherever you want, and you get an answer right on frequency. Uh, with these calling frequencies, what does that mean? You have to call CQ only on those frequencies, and then if someone answers you, you he's going to tell you to go to another frequency, or what? How does it work? Are we talking digital or sideband or in general? I'm, I'm talking about the CW or, or SSB. Oh. You can um, generally CW stations are between 50.080 and 50.100 domestic. Sometimes on 50.125, but you can call CQ pretty much anywhere you want. And if the band is open pretty good, you're going to get an answer to it. A lot of the sideband stations go around 50.125. And if they find activity is increasing so much, they may move up the band like 50.130, 140. Um, so you can work anywhere you want. Uh, those call frequencies are good when the band appears to be quiet, and then when it starts to open up, you can pretty much find station throughout the band. Um, important to know that there's still a lot of beacons on uh, between 50.060 and 50.080. Those were all the domestic uh, um, beacons are from down south and so forth. And most of those are running very simple setup like vertical and 10 watts. So if you can hear them, you know, um, you know, they're from out of state, you know that the band is open. So, um, yeah, there's no, if the band's open, you can work them anywhere. But so what do I do if I, if I, if I want to use the calling frequencies, then we immediately, we make contact, then we have to jump to another frequency? No, it's, uh, if it, you can pretty much stay on the calling frequency for a little bit. But it, it, at some point, it may be advantageous to move if the band becomes very crowded. So it's always a judgment call. But okay. uh, you don't have to immediately move. You can complete the contact and say, you know what? It's getting crowded here. I'm going to move up the band. OK. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have anything they want to ask of Ken? Sounds you like always, no. You can always ask, send an email to my email address at qrz.com. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions, any inquiries. So um, uh, it's easy enough to find. So I want to thank you all. I want to thank the people here for coming out. It's a ferocious yeah. night. Yeah, we thank you for coming out. And it's uh, had had. out of so, it's amazing. I found my way here through uh, the uh, Levittown Library, so it's a long story. But uh, it's fun to be out in conditions like this, and I appreciate all the people at home. And I'm sorry I can't see you in person. Maybe someday we will. Uh, so thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.